As just explained in the past uh, video, uh, Parafac is unique, and we have already seen that by looking at a Parafac model on this small amino acid data set. Now I'm just going to build a model again with three components. We have the data here, 5 by 201 by 61. 5 samples, 201 emissions, and 61 excitations. So I'm building the Parafact model. And... We get this model overview. We already talked about this part here, where we show the loadings in mode 1. If I click here, I get the loadings in mode 2. These are the emission mode loadings and the excitation mode loadings. Okay. Now, I just want to show what happens if I build a Parafact model with a wrong number of components. So let me build a Parafact model using two components. Or actually, let me use one component just. So, here we have the model. This is the emission mode loading. Now, let me compare that. With this one. Now, you see this is the emission mode loading of a one-component Parafact model, and this is the emission mode loading of a three-component model. And the important thing to realize here is that the models are not nested. PCA models are nested. If I do a three-component PCA model, it's going to contain the one-component model plus two more components. That is not the case in Parafact. You see that the one-component model is not part of the free component model. So this is important because it means that we have to be really, really careful when we choose the number of components. We have to choose the right number of components. If you do a PCA model, you can just do, say, a 10 component model. And even if you're not going to use the 10 component model, you can just use look at the first three components, because they're going to be the same whether you did a three component model or the ten component model. So essentially there's a lot of times where you don't have to worry about the number of components in PCA. But that's not the same for Parafact. Here you really have to worry about choosing the right number of components if you want to interpret them, for example, chemically. If I want to make claims about underlying spectra here, I really have to use the right number of components. If I just want to model the data, well then I can use whatever number of components I like. But if I want to say that these are estimates of underlying spectra, I have to use the right number of components. And a little bit later we are going to get back on how we choose the number of components, because that's very important, obviously. The reason that the number of components, uh, the, sorry, that the shape of the components change is, is because the components are not orthogonal like in PCA. The components here are definitely not orthogonal in the free component model. And that's a good thing. That's what we want. But it adds the complication that we really have to be much more careful about choosing uh, the number of components.